So, Doctors Massey and Hefner, let me turn it over to you guys. And you have the control panel, so if you would, take it away. I'm Tina Hefner, as uh, Pam already introduced and thank, induced, introduced us. Uh, thank you for those kind introductions, and welcome to everyone for our webinar. Just to outline a few of our session goals today, Dixie and I um, hope to describe to you the importance of reading complex text, what it looks like in a social studies classroom, utilizing close reading and other techniques that are specifically aligned with the C3 framework. And the C3 framework is the College Career and Civic Life framework uh, that was published a few years ago by the National Council for the Social Studies and has a direct alignment with the Common Core State Standards for History and the Social Sciences. We identify in this session ways to tap into informational texts that are both readable, engaging, inviting, and an appropriate level for the complexity of grade bands that you serve within your schools. We want to focus specifically on four strategies that promote the vision of complex text integration defined as a crossover between the C3 framework and the, college, the Common Core State Standards. At the heart of our understanding is we approach reading as a process of inquiry. We take specific steps to motivate learners to want to choose to read because if they wonder, they are naturally curious and we also want to invite them into reading text. Motivated readers will read and unmotivated readers will not. Reading motivation is connected to the text students are assigned to read. Consequently, students like social studies and they don't like social studies based on their motivations. So we described four different ways in this session of how to use informational text to support inquiry. Visual inventory, text chunking and the use of short text, close reading, and the exploration of multiple sources as inquiry pathways. And finally, we'll again model for you how inquiry is a form of inquiry and is a pathway to other lines of inquiry. This is Dixie, and thank you also for joining us. One thing I want to clarify at the beginning is when we talk about text, we use this in a broad manner, and so we use text that will refer to images as well as traditional written formats, and in our other presentations we also use text as a broad term to mean recordings, photographs, and many different resources. So in the following slides, I'm going to walk you through how we layer a series of short text as entry points for a larger inquiry. This is also to help us build some background knowledge and to provide a hook for students' engagement. And one more thing I'll highlight before I show you three images is that um, we, I in particular use these not in a social studies specific setting but with struggling readers. So there are lots of reasons we have struggling readers. They might be English language learners, they might have individualized education plans or they haven't separated decoding words from actually understanding what they're reading. That's another reason why we keep our texts particularly short, especially as we're scaffolding them in, because we aim to read larger and longer texts, but initially we stay very short so they can experience some success and so that we can go through a whole cycle of viewing and reading and discussion in a short amount of time. All right, with that, let me show you these three images. And this is how we often start. Students will see nothing but these images, and sometimes these images are displayed as they walk into the classroom. And we might not even give them a question to begin with, but just let them look. And then on the next slide, I'll just give you an overview. We ask students eventually to use this noticing and wondering frame to track what they're thinking. In particular, we use noticing because most students, even students who have a limited language or vocabulary, are often able to list at least a word or two, and perhaps they do that in their native language, but that helps them begin to start to describe. And so students, even if they don't have questions, are often able to make an observation. The questions of how these images might be related ask students to make an inference, and that's on the bottom of that frame. Now, we're going to go back to those images. Let me give you a moment to look at them, and I'll ask you then to track your own noticings and wonderings.
And then we're going to go ahead and ask you if you have some things that you've noticed and wondered to track those in the chat box on the side. So some of the noticings that we're seeing so far, noticed an archaeological dig revealing a skeleton. All three images have skulls. All are skeletons. I wonder All right. if, if I, mm -hmm. Tina, if I can get you to go ahead and go to that next slide. Okay. And I think we can actually skip over that one because we'll have the chat box to use it as a side. Some of the things that you uh, noted in the chat box obviously show that you all have a lot of background knowledge. When I do this with middle school students, some of the things that they list, skulls, and that may be all that they write in noticing. Some of them notice that there are some foreign objects in them. Some of them don't. One of the temptations is often to draw their attention to those more quickly. I like to hold off a while and see if from just their sharing, if they end up pointing those out to each other. What I really love to hear from students is when they say, oh, I didn't even see that. One of the things we find from students is if they don't know what to do with information or if it's contradictory information, they often just ignore that. So by having a conversation then, they can begin to notice other things that they might not have done. And we might even move students into groups to have them share their noticings and wonderings. And I really, as a teacher, try and hold back and not put in additional information at this point. This type of discussion can really take a bit of time to support. It's always risky to share guesses with each other, and so it's especially important to establish a community and help the students establish a community with each other. And then we offer students a chance to try and think of broader questions. This can be risky also if students don't have a lot of background knowledge. So the comment about the archaeological dig would be one that I might not expect to see from middle school students, for example, because they might not have that particular knowledge. Now, in this example that I'm showing you today, we're going to ask you to think if you have a compelling question that's rooted in your own wonderings. As follow-up prompts, we listed questions here on this slide, such as where you would go to find evidence and what sources you would use. These questions might or might not be ones that we would use with students in a classroom setting, depending on how adept they are at generating questions and using their evidence. We might find that students are not able to generate that compelling question, or the questions that they generate are very narrow. And in that case, we can model with our own compelling questions. But I always like to stop and see what students come up with because I want to assume that students have strengths and then be ready to adapt my instruction from there. So anybody think of some compelling questions, a big question that you would ask based on all three images? And if you have those, just go ahead and type those in the chat box on the side. So are they, the skeletons, all about the same age or the same time period? They're a similar cause of death? Similarities as far as who the skeletons are? So as a teacher, I have a decision to make of whether we pursue those questions or maybe we ask them uh, the question that I have to model, and we're going to show you that compelling question that Tina and I often use 
if, if the students don't come up with particular questions on the next slide, which is, what can you infer about how these people died? And then what evidence supports your inference? So we're going to take students back to evidence as often as we can. And then instead of sending them out in multiple sources, we're going to offer them another short reading. And that's coming up on the next slide. So we're going to keep in mind what we can infer about how these people died and what evidence supports our inference. We have some supporting questions that we may or may not share with students. And now I'm going to give you a moment to read this next reading. This text that's coming up is one that was adapted from a newspaper article, and let me give you a minute to read. So the newspaper article described the archaeological excavation of skeletons, but the original article was written at a difficult reading level, and it was written as many newspaper articles are, information at the beginning, then a reiteration and extension of that information, so in places it was a bit repetitive. What I tried to do is condense that, condense that and make that in a single sequence. At this point, students are taken back to the noticings and wonderings to see if they have anything from this next reading that they might add to their noticings of any questions been answered. And depending on how much they're adding to that noticing and wondering, then we may go into, that's fine, Tina, go ahead to that next one. The next source, and this is taken from a longer book called Midwinter Blood. It's by Marcus Sedgwick. Um, as an aside, the author, Marcus Sedgwick, was inspired by Carl Larson's painting of the same name when he viewed it hanging in the Swedish National Museum. He created this collection of stories based on that painting, and I'm going to give you a moment to read the excerpt of text. Keep in mind that we're looking for clues to that compelling question of how the initial images that we saw of the three skulls are related. So let's look at the next slide. Using this article as clues for the initial three images, how are the three images related? And what we hope students then add is, has something to do with vampires. There are some differences. In this case, and those have been highlighted in the slide, the account says he hammered the first stake right through Tor's chest and deep into the soil beneath. He took the second stake and drove it hard into Tor's mouth. So we would take additional time to think about and underline or highlight the evidence, as Tina has mentioned. But I'm going to move us on to the next slide where we revisit where students actually have noticed the location. You all noticed it initially. One of the things that we find when we use this with students is that students don't pay much attention, in many cases, to the locations that were listed on the original th three slides. So Tina, can we go, let's go ahead and go right to that next one then. So Bulgaria, Poland, and Italy. And one of the things that we might ask is, what do these three titles have to do with both the images and then the relationship between them? This is really going to depend on students' background knowledge. Another thing that it really depends on is students' geographical knowledge. And so what they're able to pull from just these three titles 
may not be very much if they don't have a geographical knowledge. So the next thing we can do then is to show them a map. And in this case, we've gone ahead and circled the locations. But one of the things that we might do is have students locate this place. Tina and I both have students use maps at any chance we can, in part because reading a map is another way to access information. And students may not have had a lot of opportunity to do that, especially if they're at the middle school level. So our next move would be to say, here are the three places that were listed in the examples. What might these locations have to do with the way that our images are linked? And this is going to set us up to include why location matters and to ask them about evidence. What you might notice also in the text that I've shown so far is a particular format. The, short, the texts have been short. They've been a variety of different an image, a map, had a fiction and a nonfiction piece. Again, all the scaffold students in their reading and support them as they look for both the compelling question answers as well as to move them through the text. So we'd have students make some initial inferences about what they thought about location, and then we might offer them one more text after this if it still seems that they haven't been able to fully understand what location. And if they do have lots of ideas about location, we might skip this text. So Tina, let's show that text briefly. And this one is laid out in very linear fashion. And what it hopefully sets us up for with students is a discussion about why location matters, some of the reasons that location is important to these pictures and the evidence. It might also set us up for a writing assignment. Um, but let's go ahead and consider then why I would use short text. Tina, you want to move ahead a couple slides? Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> I thought that's what you were doing, trying to do, but yeah. Okay. So let me explain a little bit of the rationale behind our thinking and how we use short text, the manner in which we uh, integrate these into the scaffolding of students thinking about content. As Dixie described very early on, she uses uh, short text and the text in a, a different manner in which she's working with struggling readers. Now, while we have struggling readers in our content classes, I'm always using short text as a way to facilitate content understanding because I'm the social studies person and I really want to emphasize how can we build and scaffold the knowledge that we want students to have about history and about the past from text without always giving that knowledge to students. So let's look specifically at short text. As Dixie's already described, what are short texts? Well, they're a brief story. And because I said it's a story, it doesn't mean that it's a text only. We define text more broadly. The three images we provided at the beginning told a story. The map told a story with the three locations on it. So images are also short text. And images particularly are very accessible for all learners. If you do use text, we recommend no more than one to two pages. And you can see in the examples we provided, they were either a paragraph or just a few paragraphs. If you have two pages, you can shorten the text even more so by chunking, which I'll explain on the next slide. Our purpose in using short text is because we want to facilitate noticing. We want students to pay attention to the details that are right there in the text. I'm going to need to pause just a moment to see if I can increase my audio. So what we want to do is we want students to notice, to pay attention to the details that are right there in the text. We want them to be able to take time to talk 
about the information that they're seeing. We want to create spaces for conversation. We want to also create time for thinking. Now, Dixie moved you very quickly through our example, but when you're working with students, you need to make sure that, that you give them time to think about their ideas. There's different types of ways in which students engage with text, and some students think more quickly than others, and we want to make sure that those who may not process information as rapidly have the same opportunities to think so that they can be equal contributors to the collaborative discussion about the information they're sharing. We also know that thinking is generative. And when students discuss and talk with others and collaborate in their thinking, that they're able to think beyond just their own frames of references. So short texts are highly beneficial in this particular manner. We also do not use short texts for the purpose of deriving a single response. Typically, if we have a lecture, we're explaining very explicitly, this is what you need to know. Our aim is to help students discover, to explore, to develop their thinking so that they can unravel understanding that is more of a process that mirrors inquiry, not that of answering, you need to know this information to answer this question on the test. So it's not outcome-oriented thinking. I mentioned text chunking. So what we're doing with text, uh, with short text particularly, is we break them into smaller sections. So if you do have a two-page short text, you can chunk it, meaning you can offer students pieces of information, just as Dixie did in the, in the example, by giving you images first, then one text, then another text, and then another text. We never use information as a single source. We always use collection of collections of information that go span across multiple sources. And we also use smaller sections to allow students to dig deeper into the text, to closely read for information that's right there, so that they can connect their inferences to the information that they're seeing within the text. We also treat each segment or each short text as a single encounter so that we explore what information that text has to offer. Our aim in doing this is to allow students to build their stamina as readers so that they can read longer and more complex texts, but to build their efficacy as readers and thinkers, and also to inspire their interest and curiosity. I've mentioned several reasons why we use short text. But we see short text as prerequis prerequisites to learning content. We learn content by generating information and generating thinking. We want students to ask questions. That's what we do with, under the C3 framework. We begin with a compelling question and supporting questions. But students don't know how to ask questions. And quite frankly, they can't ask questions about something they don't know. They have to have a knowledge base to draw from. So we use short text as an entry into content to build the contextualization that's needed to scaffold their curiosities and their interests, to motivate them to want to choose to read, but also to help them begin to have questions that are derived from the text that are there for them. We use short text also to allow students to discover. We mentioned discovery, and that came up in our, our, our text chat. By discovering, what we want them to do is to figure out information on their own. Let them unravel as they engage in a spiral way with more text and more information. We also want them to question their own thinking. So when I said about generating questions, it's not just the creation of questions. It's to question their own interpretations. So if you infer that perhaps that these individuals lived during the same time period, and perhaps that might have been a false interpretation, the teacher does not correct, but it's through the addition of information that students can begin to challenge and redirect their thinking to correct the misinterpretations that they might have. And we don't make misinterpretations false, which shut down or stifle some learners we allow them to make interpretations that are wrong, and then they correct them, and they realize that they have the capacity to inquire. And that's what inquiry really is, in, in an authentic way, more about. We generate spaces for reasoning. 
this is when short texts become prerequisites to thinking. Not every student thinks the same way. And when we don't provide space to allow students to think about text more deeply, we miss the opportunity for some learners to actually have the chance to think. There are detail-oriented thinkers, those who can be very successful at noticing information. But they might not be able to piece that information together in a manner that makes sense. They're big picture thinkers who can see these details, maybe not notice as many details as the detail-oriented thinker, but can make interpretations very quickly. And then there's the abstract or the random thinkers that just randomly connect ideas. But if we stifle any of those approaches, particularly the random abstract thinkers, we're limiting the synaptic pathways that those students have generated and how they're connecting new information to prior knowledge they might have, even if it is abstract in our understanding of the content we're trying to teach. We also want to teach students to think through text, to allow conversation to be more organic and emerging from text themselves, from the curiosities and the ideas that students are deriving from text. By close reading those texts, we bring them back to the text, we bring them back to the evidence, to the information, so that they can cooperate or contradict their interpretations. And again, we want them to read and reread and reread the text so that they can notice very closely the information that's provided within the text. We want students also to recognize the relationship among ideas that spans across text. We want them to pull together the details in the text and to make sense of those, to begin to lay the foundation for deriving hypotheses, the hypotheses that would be worthy of inquiry. We also want them to wonder if they could find more information. We want them to think about not only what this text has to say, but where might I go next to gather more information. And this is a place where teachers need to scaffold depending on the reader's abilities. We use short text, too, to promote this relational understanding and also to engage students in an authentic approach to inquiry. We want, more than replicating a procedural approach to inquiry, that you ask a compelling question, you go and gather evidence, and then you go forth in the C3 framework. Our aim is not that. Our aim is to allow for the comprehension and interpretation of text, to use inferencing as a way to encourage students to make sense on their own and individually from the text that they're actually reading. We want students to invite students to wonder to ask questions. They're not seeking to ask the right question, the one that we, the teacher, would ask. We want them to ask their questions and then to use those questions to build on them and to develop the questions that might lead them to the thinking that we might, as experts, derive. We also want to engage them in asking disciplinary specific questions. Those are often what we refer to as um, sourcing of information. Now, there were no dates that we provided with the images or with any of the texts that we gave you. But that might be a question we want to ask. Are these texts associated in that manner? We also want them to contextualize, to cooperate. We want to engage in disciplinary ways of thinking. If you're familiar with C3 and the inquiry design model, this is where C3 starts. What we're providing for you are all the steps and the procedures that precede the inquiry process that students engage with by actually practicing and learning inquiry through text. We also use text as a way to build frames of reference to help them develop contextual knowledge because they need to understand that the ideas are tethered to time, to place, to people, and to cultures. We also want them to be able to use evidence to frame a hypothesis or an argument or even to, to lay the foundation for building their own inquiry that they might want to explore. Short texts support readers too. Dixie mentioned this very early on, and how important it is to facilitate students' academic language within the, the content of social studies, to build their habits of mind. A 
And by disciplinary habits of mind, I'm referring to the heuristics of, of how we think about history. We also, also want to make pathways to other texts. We want them to engage with primary source and secondary source analyses, but they have to be able to have a foundation by which they can jump into those texts. And this is the foundation that short texts provide. This also allows for a gradual release of responsibility where students can then, through their practice with short texts, become more confident readers and inquirers and therefore be more capable of working with difficult texts that they encounter later uh, within their inquiry pathways. We also emphasize the significance of the accessibility of images. Images are available to all readers and are very appropriate, particularly for students uh, who have reading disabilities or uh, English language learners. Images create an opportunity for students to be invited into the conversation. And again, we want to think about, uh, at, and I've been sharing with you some of the images of the Fibonacci code, and the idea is that it's this spiraling outward, that is for this naturalistic inquiry that's present within our understanding of the sciences or the social sciences. Inquiry is not a process that we engage in once, it's a process that we continue over and over and over again. And it is through practice with inquiry we can become more effective in our utilization of all of the skill sets that we need to be successful at independently inquiring with more complex and difficult texts. We also support readers by scaffolding. We offered some suggestions in the text chat of how you might even scaffold the short text that we provided. Highlighting, underlining, color coding, again, use of images. We want to help students with short text to maintain their focus, to pay attention to the information that's there, and also to, pay, to be able to identify words, uh, key vocabulary that they need to pull from the text. We also want to build their stamina as readers, and that takes time. Just because we want students to engage in the process of inquiry does not mean that they'll understand how to do that from the onset. So we use short text as the beginning of a learning segment. This is the, the part where we jump start curiosity, where we build that foundational contextual knowledge that students need so that they can explore why these three people might have been buried in the manner in which they were. We also layer the use of short text. We begin with a short text, we add a second short text, and then we can add more. This does not have to be done in a single class period. It can be done something over a sequence of days. Our aim is to build contextual knowledge and academic language, but we also do not want to short sell the significance of interest and motivation. If we want to stretch students' reading ability by developing their reading skill, then it's important to set the stage for reading complex, unfamiliar text by helping students build prior knowledge before reading. So close reading becomes a positive and engaging experience that is within even the struggling reader's reach. We practice inferencing with short text, and we also help students understand the sources of the knowledge and how they're interpreting information. You can insert, insert short text in longer units as a way to break up information, but also as a way to build a framework for understanding. So let me draw you back to the C3. The C3 framework, the College, Career, and Civic Life framework, reading and writing in the social studies are not only ways of building and conveying knowledge, they are essential to understanding history and understanding the social sciences. The C3 framework embodies the aims of the Common Core State Standards, those literacy aims that embrace discipline-specific ways of knowing that are unique to social studies. The reading standards within the Common Core are closely aligned with Dimension 3, gathering evidence and evaluating sources, very similar to the exercise that we provided for you at the beginning. We also engage, want to engage students with short text through disciplinary text inquiry. And by the disciplinary text inquiry, 
we want them to think like historians. We want them to cooperate, we want them to source, and we want them to contextualize. But the expectation that students can do this without practice is not accurate. We have to scaffold inquiry just like we scaffold reading. Short texts generate pathways to achieving both the Common Core and the C3 literacy aims. Short texts allow students to have regular practice with complex and difficult texts. And many of the short texts that Dixie and, and I have um, compiled have high reading abilities or reading levels, lexile levels. But they also expose students to vocabulary that's essential to, the, to social studies, to our disciplinary understanding. We want to provide students time to engage in practices that we call in the field of social studies high leverage practices. We want students to read, write, and talk about the information that they're learning from text, to engage with others so that they can create knowledge from these texts, independent of teacher-directed thinking. We want students to build knowledge through content-rich, non-fictional text, but we also expose them to other types of texts, such as um, the fictional text that we provided too, as ways of building and supporting the, the knowledge that's derived from nonfiction texts. To achieve the rigor expected for college and career readiness, students must be able to read with discipline-specific purpose and engage in active reading dialogue with texts through reading comprehension skills and disciplinary literacies. These literacies build knowledge in the social studies through reading into and across text, making logical and evidence-based inferences, using textual evidence to interpret meaning, navigating difficult and complex text, and exposing students to various types of text, including primary and secondary sources. Students read complex texts social, in social studies closely for meaning, purpose, source type to identify text-based claims and evidence and to compare evidence across sources, very similar to the same processes we modeled with short text at the beginning. The opportunity to practice these skills more frequently is an essential component of why short text are beneficial in the social studies classroom. So how do we use short text? We've modeled here uh, examples for you. We also have a second example that we'll share with you, too. We ask students to notice. We focus on questioning. We invite, we, we sometimes offer a focus question, too, if students are struggling. And Dixie recall, uh, called this out as modeling questioning. So rather than giving a question, we model a question. So if you'll notice at the very beginning, Dixie gave you three images, but did not give you a specific question to start. So she said you'd walk into the classroom and have the images per, uh, displayed, and you let students begin to think about the images without imposing a question upon them. Because when we ask questions as experts, we potentially stifle the students that think, the thinking that students might engage in. We want to invite students to question, but sometimes that invitation to questioning requires the modeling of a focus question. We also want students to always ask, where would I go next? Because inquiry is a cycle that spirals outward, that builds a framework for our reasoning and our thinking. It's a skill set that we have to teach students, and short texts provide that framework for practicing those skills of inquiry. Short text model purposes of reading. Sometimes when we approach how we teach reading and comprehension in the social studies, even in our text choices, we ask students to read this, read a primary source with the expectation they'll come to a specific interpretation. We approach the text as if it's outcome, outcome oriented. There is a right answer. We consider information from that text to be standardized. If students approach a text and they can't derive the same meaning as the standardized knowledge, 
then they perceive their thinking to be incorrect, inaccurate. This often stifles readers to the point that they might read a text, start and say, well, I have no idea what this means. And so they, they quit as readers. And they often then turn to the teacher to tell what the meaning of that text is. And so by default, because students don't ask questions, they, we say they're not thinking, then we say, oh, I'll just tell them what this text says. But what the students have become is dependent upon the reasoning of the teachers without developing the skill of reasoning themselves. So the second approach that we might use is we may follow um, teachinghistory.org. Uh, we may follow uh, Sam Weinberg's approach to historical thinking as a procedure. First you source, next you contextualize, then you corroborate, and then you use close reading, or maybe you use close reading first before you go through all those steps. So those are the four procedures that Weinberg lays out. So they are procedures that are appropriate to historical thinking, but when we think about the natural way in which historians engage with text, the procedures are not sequential. So students perceive inquiry as a procedural process, historical inquiry as a procedural process, then their ideas cannot transfer to other texts that may not have those. What do you do when you encounter a text that doesn't have a source? We gave you several texts that did not have a source. What do you do when you encounter a different type of text that may be difficult to contextualize within time? So when students can't follow the procedures, once again, they're discouraged or perhaps even shut down as thinkers. And they turn to the teacher to tell them what the text says. Either that or they use it as potentially a skimming approach to the information that's there without reading deeply into the text, the, the inferential meanings. Because historians would not necessarily approach a text in a sequential manner, they often have a priori thinking. They have hypotheses. They also know where to go next. So if we approach reading as more of this sense-making process, very similar to what we did from the beginning and what we're, we're suggesting, the rationale for why you use short text, you allow students spaces to think, to reason, to question, to wonder with appropriate scaffolding. We want students to make sense, and as they're making sense and drawing their own interpretations, we can layer their thinking. And we, as, as teachers, then become facilitators of curiosity, meaning that we can layer on, have you thought about where these images might be referencing? There's a title in each one. Dixie drew your attention to that. So with the sense-making process, we're trying to teach students how to inquire, how to use text as a, a way of generating curiosity, but also as a way of thinking. We use text as a framework for questioning. Questioning is a universal strategy that goes across all disciplines. Questions that are asked are specific to the text, but they can also model disciplinary thinking. This is where our scaffolding as teachers is we can draw their attention to. Did you see any information uh, that might date the source? With disciplinary thinking, experts have something different to say about events and people and places. Thinking fo focuses on the types of questions that are asked by dis disciplinary experts. It's harder to ask a good question than to seek answers. But what we're trying to teach is how do we begin to question. The questions that we can scaffold for students should help them begin to open up to multiple interpretations, to direct students to evidence-informed inquiry, to keep students close to text, to, to look at the evidence that guides their thinking that might initiate more questions that move beyond text. We position facts and critical interpretations of text 
based on claims above opinions and beliefs. We need to know the sources of our information. When historians read primary documents, they read at many different levels. They simultaneously pay attention to content, source, argument, purpose, context, and credibility. But what we're asking students to do is to think about their own thinking of what they're doing as readers as they engage in the inquiry process. They ask questions such as, what does the text say? How does the text work? And how does the text mean? So in this sense, we're merging both reading scaffolding, the use of short text, and that of disciplinary inquiry. Novices can't simultaneously think about all of these steps like experts do. So we use close reading to read for one purpose, and with short text, we can go back and read for a second purpose. So the question was, well, what happens if you have to direct them to disciplinary thinking? So you read one time to source, and you can go back and reread with a different purpose, such as read for argumentation. What do you think the, the author's frame of reference is? Close reading is a disciplinary tool that can be modified, but it is not intended to be used in a prescribed way. So let's look briefly at one more example. Suppose we gave you these two images. You could approach it in the same manner of what you did at the very beginning, without a question. Or, if needed, you can also model a question. Do these images show the same person, or are they different people? What evidence would you use to support your answer? Now I'm going to go through this exercise very quickly for you, but let me direct you first, should you want more information, how to use this specific example in short text. Uh, there was, we, Dixie and I published an article in Social Education that details the example more explicitly. But let me offer a framework by which we would use this and how it generates pathways to inquiry. So we, the second step that we might ask is, which image matches this description and why? So we offer a segment, this is a chunk of a short text. Students have already brainstormed and asked questions about how the images might be related. Are they the same people? They're wondering about how did they die. There's an assumption by that question of how do they die is that both of these individuals are actually dead. We want to make students to make explicit connections to their inferences and the information they have accessible. But we also want to layer and scaffold the information that we give them so that they will read more closely the information in the text and they can connect their thinking. We also want them to continue to ask, what questions do they have? So one question that someone might ask is, who is Phineas? They might also say, well, I think that one of the images is Phineas and the other is not. Then we might ask students, where would you go next? Where would you go next to answer your questions? We offer students text collections that attend to their curiosities. Initially, we may provide text with a collection, but allow students to choose which text they might explore. Sometimes we direct students based on their own curiosities. We want to invite students also to find their own sources. Specifically, we encourage them to use internet searches, but also can introduce the credibility of the sources that they're seeking. The thinking required to select and interpret information from what's available on the internet is a critical skill that requires the same patterns of thinking we apply to more traditional social studies sources. Many of our students are familiar with digital sources, but I'm not certain they take the time to inquire about the credibility of those sources. So learning and engaging in the inquiry process, again, facilitates more than one purpose when we use short text. 
Our next step would be to introduce students to a short text. And here we have a short text that, um, Dixie, that Dixie and I authored. It's called, What a Headache. Remember, as Dixie said earlier, avoid giving students answers. Let them discover on their own. Teachers get excited about information, and they want to share the knowledge that they have. Holding back and allowing students to discover that knowledge from the text that they engage with is really important. Allowing students to share that similar excitement as content curiosities emerge from their text is an important step in promoting their interest and motivation. And here we might break the short text up, as we did before, into chunks of information so that we can layer as students begin to dig deeply and read closely the information that they're examining so that they can question, challenge, and continue to collaborate their curiosities. We always pause for questions. Asking questions is central to the evolving inquiry process that students are learning by engaging in inquiry. We have to also scaffold those questions so that we can help facilitate compelling and supporting questions that can move students through each reading and move them into other inquiry pathways. Eventually, students will recognize that the name Phineas Gage was present within the text, and they may want to know who Phineas Gage is. They can search for information on Phineas Gage, and they might come across of descriptions as Phineas Gage is known as the wide, uh, widely known as the American Crowbar case, or Phineas Gage and his tamping iron, and their images that are public domain. And then the, they also then can recognize dates because there's actually a date that's included within the short text that can bring students back to the particular time period. So at this point in time, a student might be asking me, if one image is Phineas Gage, who is the other image? We can share more information about Phineas Gage, and we could direct students to sources, and Phineas Gage School uh, resides in the Harvard School of Medicine, even today, and there's a reason for that. But I'm not going to tell you that yet. We might direct students of where they would go next, looking at comparisons, and these are visual sources that are uh, digital uh, three-dimensional three modeling as well as a, a news article, very short article that offers an auditory support so that you can distinguish between the two. The second image was of Eduardo Lete, a Brazilian worker who survived a construction injury in 2012. So the assumption early on that students made of how did they both die is not actually accurate. One of the two is still alive. Where we go to next, we have to consider the implications. We, when students start to wonder, they'll also pause and ask, so what? What does Phineas Gage, what does studying Phineas Gage have to do with anything that I need to know about history? Phineas Gage's story is actually a very curious one and is the, considered the foundation of neurological sciences as we know them today. I encourage you to go learn more about Phineas Gage, but it also has implications for how we use social media. Social media is a sharing source where we can begin to make hypotheses, very much as we did with images at the beginning, that may not be fully accurate. So when this image first appeared in, in Flickr in 2007, it was titled One Man, One Eyed Man with a harpoon. Through several years, it was concluded, based on an interpretation by a reader, that this image might actually be Phineas Gage. And it was curious because this person saw the image in, no, in a manner in which no one else had done. So what more can Phineas Gage teach us? And this is where we lay the pathway to inquiry. So I'm going to share with you very quickly, and this will be our conclusion today, of how we might use short text to build further pathways. One is to move students into noticing and wondering of other images we might draw from the Library of Congress. These primary source images detail the hard work 
of railroad building, which is exactly how Phineas Gage was injured when his tamping iron was ignited by the black powder in which he was trying to, to break up rock. There may be correlations with other industries, such as railroad or rail cable cars in San Francisco and those buildings. And we can see with other images to the right the difficulty of the job itself. But the main thing to remember is that inquiry begins with compelling questions. And those questions are questions that have to be developed from information that students can derive from text. To expect students to question without building and scaffolding their knowledge from text leaves students in a capable of asking questions that might even mirror what experts might choose to do. So there are four inquiry pathways that might be pathways that your students might choose to, to follow from the, the um, Phineas Gage story. And again, there more, there's more information on these. And I'm going to skip very quickly to the end. We have other short text resources. Uh, that you might want to go and seek more information. Um, one is beginning inquiry, and the other seeds of inquiry in world history, and also seeds of inquiry in U.S. history. 